It is enough for a person to be considered a liar if he speaks about everything that he hears. Someone comes and tells me something, so-and-so committed zina. He comes and tells me, so-and-so, he stole the money. So-and-so, he left Islam. So-and-so, he did this, he did that. If I just talk about everything that I hear, then that's enough for me to be considered a liar in the deen. That's because you hear what's true and you hear what's not true. If you talk about everything you hear, you're going to talk about what was true and you're going to talk about what was not true. So the Prophet ﷺ was sitting with his companions and a janazah went by, a dead person went by, and the Jew said, Ya Muhammad, does the person in that janazah can he hear? Can he hear what's going on? The Prophet ﷺ being the person who didn't speak about Allah's religion. He didn't speak about the ghayb without knowledge. We talk about the ghayb with no knowledge. We talk about things that we can't know about these things except through the religion. And we talk about it with no knowledge. And we have no shame, and no hesitation. The Prophet said, Allahu A'lam. I don't know if he can hear. I don't know. He didn't know at that point. He didn't know at that point. The Yahudi said, I swear by Allah, Wallahi, that dead person can hear. So the Prophet told the people, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, مَا حَدَّفَكُمْ بِي أَهْلُ الْكِتَابِ فَلَا تُصَدِّقُوهُمْ وَلَا تُكَذِّبُوهُمْ When Ahlul Kitab tell you people something, don't believe them and don't disbelieve them. That's the minhaj in Al-Islam. If you watch the news and they say so-and-so tried to do this, he tried to do that. You can't believe it and you can't disbelieve it. Especially when it deals with religion and it deals with the ghayb. But also as it relates to people's haq, their personality. This football player where they're saying he did this, he did that, he did that. The Muslim has a minhaj. Whether it's against the Muslim or against the non-Muslim, you can't believe everything you hear. And not only can you not believe everything you hear, I say don't believe anything that you hear. And only believe half of what you see. Only half of what you see. Because the Dajjal is going to come and he's going to be able to show people a lot of tricks. And this is that time that he'll be coming in the circumstances that we're living in right now. So that was one of the issues, Ikhwani. I don't have time to get into that issue deeply that I mentioned to our community. I don't say that that young boy from Nigeria, he is not guilty. And I don't say that he is guilty. But I'm not going to say that he's this or that based upon what... Now Muslims say, especially when I have a religion that told me when Al-Kitab tell you something, don't believe him and don't disbelieve him. 
If you believe them, you may believe something that is not true. If you disbelieve them, you may disbelieve something that is true. So if they say something that's supported by our religion, then we believe it. And if they say something that goes against our religion, we just believe it. If they say something that our deen does not say anything about it, and they don't bring their proofs, then we don't believe and we don't disbelieve. The first human being in their book was Adam. Do we believe that? Adam was the first human being? We believe it. It's in our book. They said that Adam and his wife were expelled from the Jannah. Do we believe that? We believe that. It's our deen. They said that Isa is the son of Allah. Do we believe that? We don't believe that. Because our deen said no. They said that Adam went to the tree and the tree was an apple tree. Do we believe that? Do we believe that? Some people are saying yes. Some people are saying no. We don't believe and we don't disbelieve because the Quran say apple tree, peach tree, pear tree, banana tree. Allah didn't mention what kind of tree, so we stop there. That's the point. So when they talk about this and they talk about that, don't believe it, don't disbelieve it. Is that me telling you that when they say they're Muslim radicals and terrorists, we shouldn't believe that? No, we shouldn't believe that. We have radical people, we have extreme people, we have terrorists from our ummah. We have that. We have that. But even in that case, they have to bring the delil. When people talk to you from the Muslims about other people, if they don't bring you the proof, don't believe it until they establish the proof. That's our religion. The person who does that in this life, he'll come out, inshallah, yomu qiyamah, and he won't be responsible for a lot of oppression that regular people are responsible for. Those people will hear, and they just say everything that they hear. Especially in regards to mass media, because they have no ethics. They just want to sell newspapers. Now the real disturbing issue though, and this is not the point of why I'm digressing, but I think it should be said. The disturbing point is, what comes to us in the Quran and the Sunnah, you'll have those Muslims who will say, I don't believe that. I don't believe if I read Surah al fatiha seven times, it'll take away the pain. I don't believe aspects of what Allah said in His Messenger say. But if it comes from Sky News, BBC, if it comes from Al Jazeera, if it comes from mass media, it must be true if we believe everything that they say. It's a problem. Anyway, I told our community that. And I spent some time on that. And then I addressed very briefly the Shabab of our community. Because that young boy who was on that plane, I know his family in Nigeria. The word, the word, come, come, how much is not in his family's vocabulary. That word does not exist in their vocabulary. Meaning, anything and everything the boy wanted and wants, his father could provide him with it because he was the chairman of the leading bank of Nigeria, Muslim men. He had castles in every single major city of Nigeria. Wealthy men. And he was very known, well known, to be a person who doted over his family. If you marry one of his daughters, you're set. You're set. Because he'd break his daughters off with money on a monthly basis. He's known for that. If the boy wanted to study in Medina, if he wanted to study in Egypt, if he wanted to study anywhere in the world, he could have gone there because the father has connection. But the young boy hooked up with the wrong group of people and he has some problems now. I don't know, did he try to do the plane or not? But based upon what the family said and what seems to be the case with Dilil, he threw away his future now. He threw away his future. So we told the Shabbat of our community, you have everything to live for. Don't throw your future away. And then we discussed some issues with the parents and the talk was focusing upon the parents, advising the parents. So one of the brothers here at Masjid al-Ghuraba, he caught me up. He said, can you give a talk this day similar to the one you gave at the khutbah? I said, okay. So I was prepared to come here to give some advice to the parents. And then it was brought to my attention, no, the talk is for the Shabbat. It's called Deen or Destruction. You, Deen or Destruction. And then I saw the picture on the pole outside. They had a picture of a person, half of them with a hoodie, and the gun is in the right hand, and the other half with a phobe, and the Quran or some book is in his left hand. Now, first thing that I want to mention, a picture speaks a thousand words, as it is said. 
As Muslims, Al-Islam governs every aspect of our lives. How you sit there, how I sit here, how we come in, how we go out. Our whole religion is about adab. Arabs, especially Pakistani, Asians, Africans. Our culture plays a lot of attention to adab. Making your child a person who has adab. Knowing how to talk to a person who's older, knowing how to carry one's self. Adab. Our whole religion is about adab. Prophet came وسلم, to perfect the adab of the people. And Islam governs everything about our lives. So the person who drew that picture, you can see his Islam. He didn't show us the image of the face, it was from the back. But I think, I think, Allahu Alam, that the Quran or that book should have been in the right hand, the good side should have been the right side. Not the gangster side, that's the problem. We want our books to be given to us in our right hands, Yom Al-Qiyam. And the left side should have been representative of the negativity of the street life and the thug life and the gangster life and so forth and so on. So the point here is, I had to change my talk. I had to completely, totally change my talk so that I can give some advice to the Shabbat and secondarily give some advice to the older people of this community, especially the parents. So in addressing our Shabbat, in addressing our Shabbat, the very first thing that I want to say, Akhwani, at the top of the list is that I'm a person who I try to understand our youth. And I would advise you brothers who are older to also do the same. Your teenage children, teenage relatives, the young people who are around us in our midst, we have to get away from that culture. There are a lot of positive things about our culture, no doubt. And El Islam does nothing but embellish the culture, makes it better. So there's nothing wrong with the culture, that's part of our religion. And the culture even has some consideration or some i'tibar in the religion, the culture, the earth of the people. It has a place in the deen. But many of our cultures are oppressive, especially towards the young people. We don't want to hear what they have to say. We don't want to take their positions into consideration. In this city of Luton, in 2010, people are still compelling their daughters to get married to people who they don't want to marry. They're compelling their sons to marry people they have nothing in common with the girl. The culture, the problem. So I want to say that I try to be a person, we also try to be a people who try to understand the Shabbat, these youngsters. And what is collected from the authentic hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that was mentioned by Anas ibn Malik. May Allah be pleased with him. Some of the tabi'een that came to Anas ibn Malik, one of the great scholars of Islam, who, when he was 10 years old, he's from Medina. The Prophet left Mecca وسلم, after living there for 13 years. He migrated and traveled to al Medina to protect his Islam and the Islam of the community in an environment that wasn't hostile like Mecca. When he went to al Medina, this little boy had grew up in Medina, he was 10 years old. Anis ibn Mali. He took care of the Prophet for 10 years while he was in Medina. After the Prophet died, some people came to Anis ibn Mali and they were complaining to him about some of the things that were happening to the Muslims from an oppressive leader from amongst the Muslims. Name was Hujjaj ibn Yusuf al Thaqafi. Hujjaj ibn Yusuf al Thaqafi was an oppressive man. He was the sword of the Muslim empire at that time. And he didn't play around, he didn't take any shorts, he didn't play any games. It was nothing for him to chop a person's head off and to sit on your body or to eat food next to your headless body. He was a serious person. So those tabi'un were complaining to the companion, this man is doing that, this man is a tyrant, this man is doing this, this man is doing that. Anas ibn Malik and other companions who we take our religion from, Usama ibn Zayd, Abu Huraira, the great companions of Al-Islam, they used to pray behind this man, although he used to do these things. They used to pray behind him. They didn't try to overthrow him. They used to pray with him and behind him. They told Anas, we can't believe what he's doing, we should do something about it. He said to those people, I heard the Prophet say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, ma min amin illa wallazi ba'dahu sharru minhu, hatta talqu rabbakum. I heard the Prophet say that there is no year except that the year that comes after it is worse than the year that preceded it. And it's going to remain like that until you meet your Lord. Every year is going to be worse. 
So this thing that you are seeing from this man, Hajjaj, if life continues, it's going to get worse. So just be patient right now. Don't go overboard. The reason why I wanted to use this hadith, Ikhwani, is because in regards to the Shabbat, our youth, one of the reasons why we should support them and try to understand them is, they're living in the worst year to be a teenager. It's not easy being a teenager right now. In 1982, I was a teenager, and it was tough. And I think I speak for everybody or most of you out there. If you reflect back to when you were 14, 15, 16, and 17, and all of the problems you had with your parents, and just trying to adjust, and just trying to live, even if you came from a family that there was a lot of love and support, things were difficult at that time, because they're turbulent times. Your mind is not developed, the environment is a problem, and there are a lot of clashes that are internal and external. So our Shabbat right now are living, doing some of the worst time, the worst time, according to this hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. From the miracles of the Messenger of Allah is what he told us about concerning the things that are going to happen close to the hour. It's going to be a lot of zina, it's going to be a lot of drinking of khamr, it's going to be a lot of fitna of women, it's going to be a lot of problems. Our Shabab are living that right now. Again, in the 80s, when the hip hop culture first started, I was a teenager. I was a teenager. Now the hip hop culture has prevailed over the whole world. The hip hop culture is in Somalia right now. The hip hop culture is in Europe, wherever you go. It used to be a thing that people frowned down upon it. But now it's something that they're making money out of. Taking the Shabab away from their religion through the hip hop culture. So we have to try to understand, we have to try to support them at this time as opposed to always being people who are going to clash with them. That's my first point of advice. It is not easy being a young person today. And we don't make it any easier for them when we put that oppressive culture on them. This is not Pakistan, the UK. It's not Pakistan, it's not Libya, it's not Algeria, it's not Somalia. We brought these kids here and we helped to create some of the scenarios that they're dealing with. It's vulnerable, it's oppressive for you to act as if the kid brought you here and now you want him to act the way people used to act back in the country. No, I don't think it's correct. We have to stand next to him, we have to support him. So you young brothers and you young sisters as well, I think it's our religious responsibility to try to understand your situation first and foremost and to get behind you and on the side of you and supporting you. That doesn't mean that you're exonerated from practicing the religion. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't be upset when you don't practice the religion and when you don't have the etiquette or the adab of al-Islam that reflects on your parents and reflects on where you come from and on your deen. Now you have a responsibility. But again, Ikhwani, this hip-hop culture is a problem right now. It is a problem. Wallahi, someone tells me the boy is not listening to hip-hop anymore and he's listening to anashi, Islamic anashi. I say alhamdulillah. I say alhamdulillah, because in the door of al-amr bin ma'roof and al nahi an munkar when you enjoin the good and prevent the evil, one of the things that you want to do is, you want to get rid of the evil totally and replace it with good. The Prophet came to Mecca, they were making shirk. He replaced that with al-Islam and tawheed. That's the best case scenario. Sometimes, you have to get rid of the evil, and then there's a lesser evil that comes. But it's not as bad as the first one. If you do that, that's progress in our religion. So if the boy was listening to hip-hop, and he was calling women bees, and calling people the N-word, I have to say it, the nigger word. When I was young, if someone said to you nigger, that was an offensive term. A term that will get your grill knocked out of your mouth, that term. But now, the hip-hop culture is in, it's cool, it's slick, it's okay, it's acceptable. That now, the Pakistani boy says to the other Pakistani boy, that's my nigga. What's up, nigga? And he's a Pakistani saying it to another Pakistani man. Because we've become desensitized through the culture. Our women, our women are called bees. I can't even mention that word. What they call a dog, a bee. And you know, the dog in Al-Islam is never acceptable. The dog is a bad creature in our deen. The dog is a bad creature. Now from the hip-hop culture, 
You call the person who's your boy, your man, you call him, that's my dog. The Muslim says, yeah, you know Ahmed, yeah, that's my dog. Because we are desensitized. And who, at whose expense? If you say, Ikhwani, a joke about Chinese people from the member, and they're listening to you and they record it, you'll get in trouble with the home office. If you say something from the member about Irish people, a joke, you'll get in trouble. Homosexuals, you'll get in trouble. If you say something about the Yahud, you will get in trouble. It is not politically correct today for the Imam to say that the Yahud come from apes or some of them. Some of them were turned into apes and swine. That's in our book. But today in this environment that we're living in, it is not politically correct or wise for the Imam to say that. Because they can turn around and say that you are anti-Semitic and you can get in trouble today. So don't say that. It's better. It's from Hikmah. So anyone who you talk about their ethnic group in a negative way or their sexual preference in a negative way, you'll get in trouble. Except people of color. It's okay to say nigga this, nigga that, nigga, nigga, nigga. You can make songs and music about nigga, black people, or people of color. And here we are, here we are. Muslims who should be trying to get away from crimes, we want to be the gangsters and the criminals. Right here. I don't know much about this city, uh, Luton, but the way it is in Birmingham, the biggest drug dealers are the Muslims. The biggest drug dealers are the Muslims. The people who use the majority of the drugs, probably the Muslims. The people bringing the drugs in, especially heroin, are the Muslims, bringing it from Afghanistan. That's the drugs that the people want in Birmingham. The heroin from Afghanistan. So my point here, Ikhwani, is for you older people, you, and I don't encourage you to listen to any hip-hop, but if you were to listen to it, more than likely you won't be able to even decipher and understand what they're talking about. And your children are speaking a language that you don't understand. So the point is, Ikhwani, the first thing I want to mention to the young people as well as the parents of these young people is that we have to get behind these people, we have to support these people in terms of trying to get to understand them. If my father, and I don't want to use that if, lo, that opens up the door or the actions of shaitan, the prophet says, well, I took lo, then the lo tafta who amal is shaitan. Don't say if I did this, it would have been that, that, did that. Don't say that. It was what it was and the way it was supposed to be. But growing up, my father was tough. He was from the old school and he was tough. And he used to try to beat sense into my head. And it didn't work. I wish he would have taken the time out just to sit me down and say, Hey, 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 you're a smart kid, man. And you know I love you. I think you should try another way. I think he would have gotten more out of me. Because the more he was tough, the more tough I became. The more difficult I became. And that's how our children are. That's how our sons are. That's how our daughters respond to the way your wife is giving her advice. The tougher you are, the more difficult they are. Prophet told us, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam, inna allaha rafiqum wa yuhibbu rifq, wa yu'ti ala rifq ma la yu'ti ala al-un. Allah is gentle, Allah is kind, and He loves gentleness. He loves gentleness. And He gives to the person who uses gentleness, He gives him that which He doesn't give the one who was rough and tough. He doesn't give the one who's sometimes rough and tough works. Because there's some people who well, that's the only language they understand. The only language they understand is when they get hit upside the head. When something happens. But generally speaking, people want to feel respected. Your son, your daughter. They want to feel respected. They want to feel that they're understood. Now I'll ask you and ask you about Allah before moving to the next point, inshallah. There was a sister from our community who comes from this area. She calls herself the, the, the lyrical terrorist. She was only 22 years old at the time. She goes down in history as being the first person brought up on the new terrorism charge, the Terrorism Act. The first person in history. When she went to the court and the judge found her guilty for writing stuff on the internet about how to make bombs and all of this stuff, they let her go. She didn't get in trouble. The judge said to that girl, you have ceased to be an enigma, an enigma to me. An enigma is something you can't understand. Something that's weird. You're trying to understand it. And the judge spoke the truth. What is a 22-year-old Muslim lady doing on the internet calling herself the lyrical terrorist 
I want to learn how to make bombs. We're going to do this. We're going to do 22-year-old girl should be thinking about getting married. She should be thinking about memorizing the Quran. She should be thinking about going to the university and studying. She should be thinking about how can I help my mother. Thinking about her future. Not wasting her time on the internet in the world of La La Land. The world of La La Land. And I don't say that that girl is from the Khawarij. I don't say that. But the Prophet told us about the Khawarij sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he said about them, Sufaha al-Ahlan wa Khudafa al-Atnan. They have crazy dreams and little teeth. Meaning they're young. They're young. So this kalam is not just directed towards the brothers here. Fathers, mothers, you have to know what's going on with your children and what they're doing on the internet, who they're going with and who they're coming with and what's going on. Which brings me to the second issue for you young brothers. That is, one of the most lethal and effective weapons of a shaitan. One of the most lethal and effective weapons that shaitan is successful in jamming people up is the weapon of drugs which is married, is inside of the hip-hop culture. The usage of marijuana, weed, cannabis now is unparalleled, unparalleled in this country and in America as well and all over Europe as a result of the explosion of hip-hop music. The videos, the big artists, that's all they do. And some of them are well known just for getting high and smoking weed. So our kids, when they watch that, they want to be like Method Man. They want to be like Red Man. They want to just be like those guys who just get high, get high. Become acceptably. It's something that's accepted in that culture. So I want to tell you, brothers, again, the biggest drug dealers in our city, Birmingham, the Muslims. The deaths that come as a result of one drug game taking revenge from another drug game, they're the Muslims. They are the Muslims. An effective and a dangerous weapon. If you want to come back to your senses and come to this religion and do the right thing, if you're getting high, it's going to be almost impossible. Not impossible. But you cut the legs from under yourself if you're getting high. Because drugs, as the Prophet says, so I'll tell them to the people of this community, La tashrabu al-khamr fa innaha miftahu kulli shar. Do not drink khamr because it's the key of every evil. It is the key of every evil. There's a program that comes out in this country, one of the more intelligent programs. It's called Question Time. It comes out on Thursday night. Not this past Thursday, but the previous Thursday, they had a question to the panel, is the society of the UK a broken society? Is it broken? The audience, the majority of them said yes. The panel, half of them said yes, the others said no, and they were trying to be politically correct. They had to show their patriotism because they're politicians. And usually they talk out of both sides of their neck, depending on what they think the people want to hear. You want to answer that question, then just look. Just look, just look at the drink and drug society that it is. The binge drinking that's allowed on the 1st of December, on the 1st of January, on the front page in Birmingham, they had the girl in the snow with a dress pulled all the way over her stomach, her underwear was showing, and she was just laying in the, in the snow because she passed out from drugs, from drinking. You heard like I heard a few days ago, a man raped, a young man raped an 80-year-old lady, 80 years old. They found him, he was drunk off of drugs and alcohol. It's the miskat of every evil. The two young brothers, two young brothers, teenagers, young brothers, they molested and sodomized another young kid and took pictures of them while they did it. They were babies who were born to mother. A mother was drinking when she was pregnant with them. At the tender age where they are right now, they were drinking. Drinking drugs. You people heard of baby pee? You people know Baby P? Baby P had his back broken. I have a son, Baby P's age. Daughter, Baby P, Baby P age. His back was broken. The back, the back was broken. And he had other bones in his body, his fingers, his toes, his shin, broken. Hip, dislocated. Who did it? The mother who drinks, 
her boyfriend, who drinks and does drugs, got upset with the boy and was breaking him up over a period of time. Broken society in London, in London. Two young kids, almost a year ago, they were patrolling their estate. This is the mentality of our youth in Shabbat, especially from a certain country, I'm not going to mention it, out of the hasatia of the thing. I don't want people to get upset. Candom Town, where some of our people come from. There are gangs that we take from our country, we come here, and we have gangs here. These two kids lived on an estate, and they were patrolling their estate. An estate is where poor people live. They're on the dole. They were out patrolling their area, where they don't pay rent, their property, their estate. Patrol patrolling it with two vicious dogs. Two strangers from the young people, 16 and 17, they saw them. They let the dogs go, and the dogs mauled the two boys. They took the dogs off of them and stabbed one nine times, he died. Stabbed the other one eight times, he didn't die. They caught him, what happened? They were drinking all day. Drinking all day. The prophet said about these drugs, Ikhwani, and about this alcohol that has become something, I'm sure, as you're sitting there, there are people who are close to us who we know are getting high, our relatives getting high. You may be that individual. Now I know anywhere you go and you start to talk to Muslims in the masjid or in a rented hall, the vast majority of them do not get high. That's how it used to be. And that's how it is for the most part. That's how it is. I don't think people are getting high. But there may be some people. Allah, Allah. May Allah make it easy for us to get rid of those vices. Anyway, the Prophet said about it, Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Ala Alaihi Wasallam, Al-Khamru Umur Fawahish Ida Sharibaha Man Sharibaha Taraka Salah Wa Waka Ala Ummihi Wa Kharatihi Wa Ammatihi He said that these drugs, alcohol, it is the mother of all Fahisha. You know what Fahisha is like a lot of Fahisha, when a lot of Fahisha. He said that it is the mother of all Fahisha. Al Fahsha. If a man, whoever drinks Khamar, he does drugs, he's going to abandon Salat, and he'll have relations with his mother, he'll have relationships with his maternal auntie, he'll have sex with his paternal auntie, because it is the mother of Fawahish, he'll do it with anyone. Remember when they asked him, what is Khamar? What's the prevailing meaning of the Khamar? Is it just in the liquid form? Does it just come from grapes? just come from corn? What is khamar? He said, al-khamar ma khamra al-aqal. The khamar is that thing that causes your mind, it covers up your mind. Whatever causes your mind to be covered and you can't use your intellect correctly, then that's khamar. Qat wallahi is khamar. Qat by the Lord of the Kaaba is khamar because it covers up your mind. And that's why when people sit and eat it, they start at an awesome time all the way to the fudge time the next, door, the next day. On his right mind is going to waste all that time eating cock. If the person drinks it, he'll do anything. Now, he may not necessarily have sex with his mother. Another meaning of that hadith is, if a person does hummer or he does drugs, he may fall on his mother. He may fall on his paternal aunt, his paternal aunt. If a person is a crackhead, he has a crack problem, he will steal his mother's money. He'll steal her gold and go out and sell it. His auntie comes to visit in the house. She puts her money somewhere, you know, the thing that the woman carries the money in. We call it a pocketbook. I don't know what you call it, a handbag. She puts her handbag and she forgets about it because she's in the home of her sister or her brother. The boy's mother or father, because he's on drugs, heroin, he goes into the bag and takes the mother, the auntie's money, like that. Where's the adab in that? That is one of the biggest ayes that says the Arabs of the past, of Jahiliyyah. That's something that was unthinkable to them. They will make shit with Allah. They will make shit with Allah. They will bury their daughters alive because they were crazy like that. But there were certain things that they saw as being, this is a big problem. Someone stole the money of his auntie or the base. He comes to your house. He's my guest. He comes to my house. He doesn't know that my brother or my sister, my son is a crackhead. So he lays his stuff out in the room and he goes, comes with me to the message of the net. My son does drugs, goes into the base, the guest, goes into his, into his suitcase and steals his money to get high. 
And the hip-hop culture is something that encourages the people, do this, do this, do drugs, hit high. This is one of the worst tools, Ikhwani, that the shaitan and the worst and most effective tool that shaitan uses against people to get them off of the square and out of their minds. So it should be avoided. If you have a drug problem, you need to get around some people who are going to help you to kick your problem. Concerning khamer and drugs, the Messenger of Allah told the people, not only is the khamer the mother of al-fawahish, of al-fahisha, he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, al-khamru umul khabaith. It is the mother of all things that are khabith, nasty, dirty. In our religion, there are many, many ayat of the Quran and many ahadith of the Prophet وسلم, that tell us that we have to eat and drink from the tayyi back that Allah has given us in this world. Many, many ayat. And we have to eat and drink from the tayyi back. Ya ayyuhal ladina amin. Kulu mimma razakna lakum halal. Ya ayyuhal ladina amin. Kulu min al ard. Kulu mimma fi al ard. Halal tayyiba. Eat those good things that are halal and those good things that are pure. Don't eat the khabith. Don't eat the khabith. What's khabith? What's khabith to us Muslims is don't eat snakes. No one in his right mind going to eat a rattlesnake. Don't eat cats. The cat running around the street. Someone brings a cat and he took the skin off his head. We're going to eat this cat. I mean, Muslims are say, I will eat that. Khabith. Not eating that. Defecation. You know what defecation is? You brothers know what defecation is? It's the waste from the human being. It's the waste, the poo, akramakum Allah. You're not going to eat that. That's khabith. That's from the worst khabat. You're not going to eat that. But the Prophet said about drugs and khamr, al khamru umul khabait. It's the mother of all filthy things. And from the miracle of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, before we move on to the next point, inshallah, from the miracle, and there are many miracles from him. From his miracles is that he told the people, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam, in regards to drugs and alcohol. In an authentic hadith that was collected by the Imam al-Bukhari, Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu, he said that the Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam, من شرب خمرا لن, لن يقبل الله تعالى, تعالى صلاة الأربعين يوما. Anyone who drinks khamr, Allah is not going to accept from him his salat for 40 days. 40 days. Where does that word, that 40 days come from? Muslim, Muslim scientists, Muslim scientists. They said that's from the miracle of the Prophet. Person who drinks khamr, the effects of khamr linger on in the body for that amount of time. In the blood, in the veins, in the tissues, in the stomach, in the intestines for 40 days. 40 days. How did he know that 1400 years ago? So look at this amazing phenomenon. Shaitan, look at it. The person wants to get religious and Ramadan is tomorrow. He decides, today this is the last day I'm smoking a joint. I'm smoking after today. I'm going to fast Ramadan. He fasts starting tomorrow and he smoked all before the month of Ramadan. He smoked all of Shaban, half of Shaban. His whole Ramadan passes him by without any benefit because for 40 days his Salat is not accepted. He still has to pray, but his Salat is not accepted because he has the lingering effects of Khamar inside of his body. 40 days. And if that's the case with the Salat, that's the case with the Salat, which is the biggest Rukn of the Arkan of Al-Islam, the biggest pillar after La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. If the Salat is destroyed, then the Zakat, then the fasting, then making Hajj Umrah, all of that is destroyed as well. Khat is the same way, Ikhwan. It is a drug. And it's not permissible to use it thinking it's natural and it's from the ground. And cigarettes, although I don't say it's a drug, I don't say it's a drug like that. Your salat is not accepted for 40 days. I don't say that. But cigarette smoking is the cousin of all of that stuff. That's why you find people who drink and get high, they usually smoke cigarettes as well. 4,000, 4,000 chemicals in cigarettes. Nicotine alone stays in your body from four to seven days. What about the arsenic? What about the carbon monoxide and all that other stuff? 
That's why when people smoke in the month of Ramadan, after fasting, when they want to, they break their fast, we think, and we can't understand. Yeah, you fasted all day and you left the cigarette alone. Why are you going back to it? Because he's addicted to the cigarette. It's like a drug. So the point here is, anybody who is engaged in getting high, or you know people who get high from our relatives when they're doing drugs and these types of vices of a shaitan, that's one of the quickest ways that a person leads himself to destruction. A person wants to come back to his senses in the religion, get off drugs. And it's very difficult to get off drugs. And it's come, we come to the next point. It's very difficult to get off drugs if you don't cut your relationships with the people who do drugs. All of you, all of you, brothers and sisters, all of you, in our religion, we have a religious responsibility to take the time out and to evaluate and to look at who we've taken as our friends. This is my friend, my best friend. I come with him, I go with him. This is my man right here. The religion tells me, take some time out of your schedule and look at him and consider what I know about him. And not to just take him as my friend haphazardly like that. Well, it just happened. He's cool with me. We went to high gym. We're friends now. No, I have to evaluate how he has been over the years with me. What did I see from him? And then based upon what I see, I have to take a position. He's going to be my acquaintance. He's not going to be my friend. The Prophet told the people, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and Mar'u ala Deen Khalili. Falyandur ahadukum man yukhalil. A person is on the religion of his friend. So let him look at the one he took as a friend. You come to me to marry my daughter. You come to me. I say, you want to marry my daughter? Okay, I'm going to ask the people. Before I ask you what kind of work you do, what this is, who are your friends? Who are your friends? Because as that authentic hadith clearly suggests, and that's from the, again, the miracle of the Prophet. It's from his eloquence. He said, Al-Arwah, Junudun Mujallada. Ma ta'arafa minha ihtalafa wa ma tanakara minha ihtalafa. He said, The souls of the people, the ruh, everyone's ruh, they're like trained soldiers. There is some spirit, some ruh, when they come and they meet, they just get along. They harmonize and they gel. And there are other ruh that when they come together, they clash. You can't get along with them. The great scholar of Islam. The Amir al-Mu'minin al-Hadith and Imam Sufyan al thawri He said about this hadith, the souls are like trained soldiers. They get along, some of them, and others can't get along. He said, if there was a masjid, in that masjid there were a hundred people. From those hundred people in the masjid, ninety-nine were munafiqun and there was one mu'min. He said, when that one hundred and one mu'min comes, Somehow, some way, he's going to gravitate to that one mu'min in that masjid because his soul is going to gravitate towards his. He's going to sit in the masjid. He sees the mu'min act in a certain way. Ninety-nine of them are innovators. One is a person of the sunnah. This man comes as a guest from a foreign land. He comes. He's going to find that one man on the sunnah because his soul is going to gravitate towards his and vice versa. He sees the way he's praying. He sees he's not engaging in what the other people are doing, ooh, 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 all of that. So he'll come and he'll grab it. And the opposite holds true. A masjid, a masjid. In that masjid, there are 99, 99 believers, and one mu'min comes in. 99 believers, one munafik, whatever the equation is. People are going to find their way to those who are like them, who are similar to them. And that's why it's not correct, you reverse in Al-Islam, you a janet like myself. We heard some people in our city, there's a masjid called Masjid Rahma, where many of the people are from Somalia. And they're from the north part of Somalia. And that's where most of them go to that masjid. And they were criticizing the masjid for being a racist masjid simply because the people were Somalians and they were from the north. That's not something you can criticize a masjid for. Birds of a feather flock together. That's natural. Believers go with the believers. Kuffar go with the kuffar. That's just natural. There's no mu'akhada in the religion for something like that. For it happening naturally. 
As for the people doing things to make it, keep it that way. That's a different story, but it happens naturally. So my next form of advice to the young people is, you have to take the time out, Khwani, to pay attention to your companions. Pay attention to who your friends are. You mothers and you fathers, you have to look at who are the companions of your children. That boy from Nigeria, his father did something that was commendable. Three months before that incident happened, he called the police. He got in touch with the American Embassy. He went to the authorities and he said, I'm afraid my son is involved in something that's going to be a problem. When the issue happened and he got caught, the boy, the father was free. The father was in blame work. Now we have to understand this when I'm telling you right here. If you know or I know of someone who wants to blow something up, he's radical. You're a mother, you're a father, you're a teacher, you're an adult, you work with the youth. And you hear someone talking about blowing something up. You have a religious and a moral responsibility to connect to that boy or that girl, pull them to the side and talk to them. To get the imam involved, tell his parents on him. You have a religious responsibility to tell him, what are you doing? It's not our religion. You have to defuse his time bomb. If he insists and he persists and you think that he's going to go do something, you have a religious responsibility in this deen to go and tell people on him, to tell the authorities. Don't do what the other extreme Muslims do. We have two extremes. We have those Muslims who bend over backwards and they compromise their spinal cord. They bend over backwards to please non-Muslims. They bend over backwards to make the government happy with them. And they lie on people. Don't be like those. I'm not saying go out and spy on the Muslims to get Muslims in trouble. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, if you hear of that situation, then you have to eradicate it. You have to try to defuse it. If it doesn't work, you can't leave that for something to go and take place and then you become an accomplice if they were to look at the situation and found that you knew about it. So the mother, the father of the, every child, you have a religious responsibility to be on top of and involved with what's going on with your children. One day, our messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he got out of the bed and he was in Aisha's house and he thought she was asleep and he quietly and gingerly got out of the bed. He took his clothes and put it on his arm. He took his shoes and he went out quietly from the door and he left. She wasn't asleep. She saw what happened and she woke up as well, put on her clothes and she followed him. She followed him to the graveyard. When he went inside of the graveyard, he put his hands up and he was making dua to Allah in the graveyard. When he came back into the house, Aisha was breathing up and down. Her chest was going up and down. Her stomach was going up and down as if she was running. The Prophet said, Ya Aisha, what, what's the matter? Why are you breathing like that? She said, nothing, Ya Rasulullah, no problem. He said, if you don't tell me, Jibril is going to tell me. She said, I saw you when you got up and you left, so I followed you. I thought you were going to go to one of your other wives' house. The Prophet didn't punch her for being jealous. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't defuse the problem like some of the men who have more than one wife defuses the problem. You're divorced, you're divorced. He didn't do that. He said, no, no, no. You think I would do that to you? I'm the messenger of Allah. Jibril came to me and told me, go to the Baqir and make dua for the people who are in the grave. So I went. So I went. This hadith has a lot of benefits. The reason why I'm mentioning it to the mothers and the fathers here, because goes to show that the father, the husband, the leader of the house, the mother, they know what's going on with people around them. The Prophet had enough insight to see something is not right with his wife. Something is strange. Something is not in his place. Why is she breathing like that? Some of us, we don't know what our children are doing. We don't know what they're doing on the internet and other than that. And I'm dealing with an issue now where the girl was going in her house with her friends every weekend 
with vodka bottles and orange juice and they was getting drunk upstairs. Never, ever, ever did the parents ever think their daughter was drinking. Ever. Drinking with who? Other Muslim girls who were young. The, young, the oldest one was 15. That's what's going on in our community. And I told you, brothers, the last time I was in this masjid, the father of four sons, four brothers, four brothers, friends, two brothers, two other friends, they took the car at 3 o'clock in the morning, they crashed into the wall, all four of them died. All four of them. 7,000 people came to the Janazah. 7,000. A lot of Muslims, they closed the school down. I saw with my own eyes some of the friends who had a shirt, R.I.P., rest in peace. That's not our religion. That's hip-hop culture. They were up the street from the masjid, opened up some wine, and poured some of it out and said to the brothers who are not here, as a dedication to those who are not there to drink. That's what kuffar do in America from a long time ago. Before you start drinking with your game, you open it up and you pour some up out of respect of the soldiers who died. Muslims are doing that. But the point is, the four boys who died, when the police went to the man's house and knocked on the door at 5 o'clock in the morning, fudger time, the father came downstairs. He said, I'm sorry to tell you, your son has been in a car accident and he's dead. The man said, not my son. My son is upstairs sleeping. And he went upstairs and he got the news that broke his heart. His son was gone. We have to know what our kids are doing, what they're up to, what they're about. And you brothers, you young brothers yourselves, you have to take consideration who you're hanging out with because if you don't change your companion, you're not going to be able to, con change, to change your condition except by Allah's permission in this extremely difficult. So I want to end on what Allah said in the Quran and Allah doesn't lie. He doesn't lie. Hashanillah. Everyone who is your friend in this dunya, everyone is going to come and your friendship with him is going to be a cause of sorrow. Everybody's friend. You're going to regret that you took him as your friend. Everyone. With one exception. He said in the Quran, يَوْمَ يَعُدُّ الظَّالِمُ عَلَى يَدَيْهِ يَقُولُ يَا لَيْتَنِ اتَّخَفْتُ مَعَ الرَّسُولِ السَّبِيلَ يَا وَيْلَتَا لَيْتَنِي لَمَا اتَّخَذْ فُلَانًا خَلِيلًا لَقَدْ أَضَلَّنِي بَعْدَ إِجَّاءَنِي الذِّكْرِ وَكَانَ شَيْطَانُ لِلْإِنسَانِ خُذُورًا يوم القيامة the oppressor one, the ظالم the person is going to come and he's going to be biting on his hand and he's going to say, oh, woe unto me, woe unto me I wish I would have taken the way of the messenger I wish I would have followed what he said when it comes to looking at who I took off as a friend when it comes to what he said about practicing the religion when it comes to what he said about not getting high when it comes to what he said about not being like the kuffar when it comes to what he says about having edab and everything about the religion oh how I wish I took the way of the messenger oh woe well, unto me I am destroyed because I took so and so as my friend and verily shaitan is forever someone who misguides and he tricks and forsakes mankind everyone is going to be in that situation in regards to your friend whoever your friend is unless your friend has a characteristic that was mentioned in another ayat of the Quran they're the only exception and they are the people who have a taqwa Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the other ayat Al-Akhillau yawma idhin ba'dun bi ba'dun adun illa al-muttaqin the friends are going to be enemies one to another yawm al-qiyamah except the ones who have a taqwa the ones who have a taqwa they won't be enemies because if he took his friend based upon taqwa he's going to advise him and he's going to advise him back he's going to help him and he's going to help him back he's going to be there for him he's going to be there in return and reciprocating the cooperation the people who have the taqwa لا تصاحب إلا مؤمنا ولا يأكل طعامك إلا تقيم. Don't be the companion except to a mu'min. And don't let anyone eat your food who is not a person of a taqwa. Don't let anyone eat your food who is not a person of taqwa. And don't be the friend except to the mu'min. And that doesn't mean you have to be bad and mean to non Muslims. Doesn't mean that you can't give them da'wah and so so on. But we don't take them as our bosom buddies because we have the issue of al-wala wal-wara. 
This is the advice that I want to present to you brothers here today. Put an emphasis on supporting one another. I think these types of talks, we need more of them. And we want to get away from those cultural talks that really don't have anything to do with the price of peanuts. They do two things. They keep us backwards and ignorant. And they even push our Shabab away and out of the religion. Biggest masjid in Birmingham. Physically. The structure the biggest one. They had a talk. A series. And the talk is why you must have a medhat. You have to have a medhat. That talk is not going to help us. It's not the type of talk that's going to help young people in our community. Why you have to have a medhat? The one before that, Al Imam Abu Hanifa, Al Imam Abdul. The one before that, why you have to make a taqlid, do blind following. Those kind of talks, they keep us backwards. Not because they don't have a place in the religion. Those things can be discussed in the religion. But as the main topics that we're bringing to our Shabbat, who wants to hear that? And then hearing it, what type of practical benefit on the ground does it give us? With the problems that we're dealing with, the issues that we're facing, and the concerns that we have. It's these types of talks, the real ones that are on the ground. How do we get married? How do we get divorced? How do we stay married? How do we prevent ourselves from getting divorced? Having respect to the parents. Parents having respect for the Shabbat. These are the khutbahs and the talks that we need to be exposed in our community to. The reality of what is the issue of the people. And not that other nonsense. That when young people, they listen to it, they say, look, I can't relate to Al-Islam. Given the choice between listening to hip-hop or going to a concert or listening to what the Muslims have to say, he's going to choose the concert any time of the day because he relates to that a little bit more than he does to what is being said in the masjid. So may Allah Azza wa increase the idara here in Tawfiq and help you brothers to support the administration and help the administration to know the pulse rate and the beat of the community and collectively, hopefully inshallah, you brothers will get over the hump because Luton is a hot spot in the circles of many people in government. May Allah protect all of them. So if you brothers have uh, where is the, the responsible person here? Um, that guy Farasik or any of those brothers. Dukad is here? Noor. Noor. The brother said that uh, he moved from Birmingham and he came to Luton. It's a smaller town, much smaller than Birmingham, which is the second largest city in the country after London. And to his surprise, he found that the drug problem in Luton paralleled the drug problem in Birmingham. Even it may be worse. So what can we say in that regard? Drugs are prevalent in um, this whole country. But the more you go towards the rural areas, the better it is. I lived in a place up in West, West Yorkshire called Keithley. And the cows and the sheep were more than the people. And because of that, the lifestyle up there was better, was more wholesome. As a matter of fact, every time I would go back to that place from a dower trip, when I started to see the grass and the animals, I used to really feel like I was going back home. But any time I go back to Birmingham from London or wherever, it's dirty, it's dark, it's dingy, the smoke, I don't feel that way. That's because things are compact and everyone is on top of each other. And that is the life of the big cities. Luton is a very congested place. And as a result of that, you find the drug culture is prevalent here. And I think we have to become very serious about addressing the issue and not putting our hands, heads in the sand as if it doesn't exist. We'll be surprised. Many of our children, many of the Muslims, they get high. Many of them. They, they are users, habitual users of marijuana and other than that. So I think that the community, 
leaders of the masjid and the community should come forward, start putting on seminars, and people have to take responsibility for their own personal uh, family, getting their children, reeling them in, finding out what's going on with them and what's going on with those who are around them. Because from the drugs, as the hadith said, it is the key to every evil. From the drugs comes the gun crime, comes the gang crime, comes the illicit baby, comes the rape, and all of that stuff. So it has a knock-on effect. And something has to be done. In America, there is the tragedy where the government itself was responsible at one time for putting crack in our community, the African-American community. Where they put it in there. They said that they were trying to help the Contras of Nicaragua and they were selling them arms with Iran. They allowed some of those people, the phenomenon of crack that was in America in the 80s, was helped to be pushed by the government. Destroyed a lot of people's lives. So a lot of times it's just uh, the responsibility of the people, the people of our religion to get serious about it, work in the community more aggressively, take the initiative to try to uh, wage war against this issue of drugs and not wait for non-Muslims and the government to come and do anything. We have to do it ourselves. Allahu uh, Can I just uh, add to this? Because uh, the brother's asking a question, um, he wants advice. How do we deal with this issue of drugs? You know, really and truly, Juan, we need to look at ourselves. Perhaps we are part of the reason why there is so much drugs in Luton and so much crime and so many Muslims away from an Islam. I think probably a vast, a good number of us here, our parents, have got children. We put our children in an environment of a non-Muslim school and then expect them not to go into drugs. Expect them not to you know, love music, have boyfriends, have all this peer pressure. We ourselves are the problem. We have Muslim schools, full of Muslim schools all around us. Yet we choose to put our children in these schools. And we think, oh no, it's my, 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 my daughter, my son. When they grow up, they'll never be like this. They'll never have a boyfriend. They'll never run away. They'll never have to go on drugs. They'll never do this. They'll never be drinking vodka and orange juice upstairs in the front room. Or, you know, my son's always asleep. He doesn't go out at night. So I started finding him dead in the morning. But we're really fooling ourselves, Akhwan. Think about your own lives, yourself, and tell me, when did you become practicing Muslims? And what your schooling was like, what your college was like, what your university was like, your primary school, what was it like? That's your answer there. You think of it in a, in a, from another angle. You allow your child to go in, in, in this environment, this un-Islamic, any yani immoral, environment from half past eight in the morning till half past three. Six, seven hours a day, times that by five days a week, 35 hours a week. Seven hours of the 12 hours that child is awake. He's, the, he's with an environment in a more immoral society, immoral group, girls and boys next to him lying and cheating and swearing and backbiting and talking about, you know, fashion and music and cars and you expect him to memorize Quran and become righteous, to be strong in the deen? Khan, we have only ourselves to blame. Why is it that the vast majority of Muslims are pushing drugs here today in Luton? Why? It's because of their upbringing. The parents, as I was mentioning earlier, didn't take care of their children. That's the first thing. Second thing is they didn't they were not careful enough to monitor and watch their children grow up. I know one particular brother, he said to me, my daughters and my sons, from their age from 16 to 11, he said, and they don't leave my sight. They go to Muslim schools and they come home and they're with him in the evenings. He gives, he gives them their, their social play the weekends, he takes them where they want to go, but he doesn't let them roam the streets, walk the streets. Have friends, you know, who, who are, you know, who doesn't know who their friends are. I want to know who my child is meeting with. Who is my, who, who are my child's friends? And then, some of us have this idea in our minds where we think, well, we can't afford Islamic schools. Of course you can afford Islamic schools. Just work it out backwards. 1,300 pounds a year, maybe 110 pounds a month. 110 pounds a month, how much is that a week? 
25 pound a week we can sit 25 pound a week 5 pounds a day people can't afford to pay 5 pounds let's put aside 5 pounds there but they can afford to buy cars go on holiday you know they can afford to you know paint decorate their home This is the thing, Ikhwan. We don't uh, reflect and we don't think, we don't reflect and we don't think about our future generation's consequences. And we don't understand that we have a responsibility to play in this. You know the old saying, it takes a village to bring up a child. Sometimes the mother and the father, the parent are not sufficient. You need to have the uncles, the aunties, the, you know, the extended people in the community to help. And how do they help? By speaking to them, giving them da'wah, giving them good nasiha. So these, some of these youth is here today. They don't think they're not my son, it's not my, my, my nephew, it's not you know, my cousin, so I don't need to give advice. No, talk to them, make friends. This is the way we have to preserve. I see a lot of you are being very itchy to go now, inshallah. So, subhanakallah, alhamdulillah.